Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Angela Lovzarenka, and I am the program development person for Lactation Education Resources. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Sakita, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah. I second all the good mornings, good evenings, good afternoon. I am Sakita Lewis Johnson. I am the lead nurse planner and an instructor for LER, and I am so glad to be here today. Me too. So just to give you a little bit of a background on us, I have been working in uh, breastfeeding and lactation um, community support first for over 30 years. And then I have been board certified uh, for 23, I want to say. I've been worked in the hospital. I've worked in the community. I've worked in private practice, teaching in a variety of arenas. And Sakita, how about you? Ooh, okay, so I am a board certified family nurse practitioner. I am a IBCLC and have been for a little over 11 years now. I am also a birth doula, but I've been in the nursing field maternal child for over 20 years. So uh, my my lactation experience kind of predates my credentials, but I also have worked in hospitals uh, as well as community work and private practice. So the reason we wanted to give you a little bit of background is because Sakita and I have quite a bit of experience between the two of us. I think the two of us really round out um, a lot of lactation support that is offered around the world. I've also um, worked in uh, worked with the different certifying boards, so IBLCE, as well as with the International Lactation Consultant Association. So worked with, with uh, those organizations, and so it's really nice to get that well-rounded picture. And so we are here to help you to prepare for the exam. We know that it's in, for some of you, it's in a few days. For others, it's in a couple of weeks, and so it can be a very very um, nerve-wracking and a very stressful time. So we are here to get you started so that you feel comfortable and confident as you are sitting this exam. So first, we're going to provide you with a few ground rules. So please do not photograph or record this information with a camera or a phone or any other equipment or recording device. This session is being recorded by us and we will have it available for you after the session is concluded. Please do type your questions into the questions box. Our goal is to answer the questions at the end of the session, and I have a feeling we're going to go longer than an hour. So if you need to hop off, not a worry. You can listen to the rest of it later, but uh, do we are going to try to get to all of your questions. And I literally, you can actually see in my camera here, I have all of my textbooks ready for you, ready to answer. I know Sakita has hers as well. So we've got our books here, even some of those that you may not have seen. Scene. So we are ready for your questions and we will answer, do our best to answer all of them. Okay, Sagita, so you ready? All right, I am ready. So I am going to kick it off and we're going to start with medications. Uh, so about this review, we, Angela and I will be reviewing key concepts. Uh, this will not be the comprehensive of, I can't tell you what's on the test, I don't know, but I'm going to give you what I got and I'm going to give you what I think uh, is important. I also just reset for certification, uh, what I said, at my 10 years, so it's been over 11 years, so not too long ago. So we're going to begin with medications and um, we're just going to hit it. Next slide, please. So some key points to remember about medications is that the amount of a drug excreted into milk is going to depend on many factors. And so there's some key terms that you want to be familiar with. The milk to plasma ratio, that is useful to evaluate the concentration of a medication in the plasma as compared to milk. You also want to be familiar with the term relative infant dose. This is an important clinical parameter to determine the safety for the infant. Oral bio bioavailability determines the plasma levels and overall risk to the infant. So remember, I said there's many factors. There are many factors. Medication will enter the milk compartment only from the mom's or lactation person's blood. So, which means that some topical pr uh, preparations may not necessarily enter. So that's what I mean by that, okay? 
The other thing to remember is during the colostral phase, the transfer of medications into milk is high. And that has to do with some open junctions that are wider open. Uh, so, the, but the total dose transfer to the infant is lower because colostrum is only given in so little quantity. So you wanna make sure that you understand that concept. Next slide. So another thing to remember is that most drugs do enter the milk, but they enter at clinically insignificant levels. However, in doing that, you always want to determine the levels in the milk, the relative infant dose, which is the RID that's there, and the lactation risk category. When you look at lactation risk, for example, in Hale's book, he classifies uh, lactation medications from L1, which is the safest, to L5, which is hazardous. So you wanna be familiar with that. You also wanna recognize and be cautious of high vitamin doses. Uh, for some reasons, those are indicated in, for, for patients, but you want to be cautious when uh, counseling families. Also, some of the key things to, if you caution, if you have clients on this, or if you see a question related to high doses of sedative drugs, opioids, radioactive agents, any chemotherapy or anti-cancer drugs, or high doses of iodine are all not recommended. Next slide. I am also want to stop here and pause and say, I know that I'm going fast. We have a lot to cover. There are some tables of medications. I've had a couple people reach out to me and say, hey, Sakita, what medications are going to be on the exam? I don't know the question. So what I did was I looked in the lactation uh, core curriculum um, and I pulled the medications right out of that book. Um, Angela, are you reaching for that book? <laughs> Uh, so, we're going to start off with antibiotics. Antibiotics are commonly prescribed for breastfeeding mothers, and they often have questions about the safety. So, as a general rule, antibiotics are safe. However, this is a table, and what I did is listed the drug and the common name. I listed the common name just for an FYI. A rule of thumb, you see antibiotics, some of them end in ampicillin, and you see some of them end in the IE, like erythromycin. So those are the things you want to pay attention to. The common name is just FYI, but also look on the other side where you see the L category. Remember I mentioned Dr. Hell's book, L1 through L5. We've put those there for you to kind of understand where antibiotics fall on the lactation risk category. Uh, in saying that, there's more to consider, but this is the actual category. Some of the concerns to be concerned about for infants is just changes in the infant's gut flora and antibiotic resistance. And we worry about that for anyone placed on antibiotics. Next slide. Antifungals. Antifungals are commonly prescribed uh, for yeast and there's also lots of questions about some of these, especially if you have to put it topical. A lot of people say, is this safe for breastfeeding? So as a rule, those are also safe. But if someone is diagnosed, and these are used for yeast. When I say yeast, some people say thrush, can, um, candida, you will hear various terms. Uh, but both the mother or a lactating person and infant should be treated simultaneously if they are diagnosed with that uh, because it can keep passing back and forth and sometimes it's very hard to treat. So topical antifungals such as the nystatin and the myconazole uh, are listed here. They're listed, the nystatin is an L1. You can see that uh, thiflucan is an L2. And then we go on to um, clom clomit Trazol, uh, which is Lotrimin, which is an L3. I'm sorry, an L2, I think. Yes, two. So, so Hale has it listed as an L2. However, the reason why I was thinking it was an LD is because it um, L3 is because it has been implicated in contact dermatitis, and so this is the one that should be avoided if all possible. Next slide, please. All right, pain medications, analgesics. These are used uh, for pain relief, 
for headaches, they're used during postpartum, they're used sometimes during pregnancy. Um, but pain relief you will see most often on the postpartum unit or after delivery are listed in this chart here. When you look at the first, uh, the first medication, Tylenol, Tylenol 3. So Tylenol is by itself an L1, which is practically safe. However, when you add codeine to it, it makes it as an L4. So L4 is that classification that indicates it's possibly hazardous. There are a few people that, that are predisposed with a genetic trait that makes them very rapid metabolizers of codeine. And then that entails what get in the milk. And um, if you have Hell's Book, you can read about some of those studies that they've been able to determine uh, this. The FDA and numerous drug advisory groups have totally recommended that codeine no longer be used during lactation. Moving on to Norco, which is another medication you'll see, and that's a combination of acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, and hydrocodone. And again, it's a, it's a combo drug, but you see that the hydrocodone is an L4. Motrin um, is, is Advil or ibuprofen, that's an L1. That's uh, considered a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And aspirin is an L2. However, you want to be cautious when, uh, when counseling if an infant is sick or has a fever because it's associated with RISE syndrome. Morphine is a narcotic and also hydromorphone. Those are both narcotics and those are very potent narcotics. Morphine is used in the spino for C-sections and also can be used for post-surgical pain. Um, it is fairly safe, but one of the things you wanna rec um, recognize is that all narcotics should be used for short time frames. Some of the concerns for an infant is sleepiness or poor feeding. Next slide. Anti-convulsant, anti-seizures. These are medications. Again, I'm not going to go over each one. This is a table. We will have the tables for you, so you don't have to worry about writing all of this down. Um, magnesium sulfate, I do want to point that one out. That is used. It's really a laxative, to be honest with you, but it is used to uh, treat preeclampsia to prevent seizures. And a lot of folks are always told, you can't breastfeed with MAG. I hope that that's not still happening. However, you, you can absolutely breastfeed with MAG. Um, but some of the concerns, again, with anything that affects the central nervous system, which is anti-seizure, anti-convulsant, is you want to uh, watch out for sleepiness, a baby that's irritable, or poorly feeding. Next slide, please. Antidepressants. Um, this is huge as we've been hearing lots of advocacy for postpartum mood disorders. Uh, these three antibiotics appear to be safe for breastfeeding mothers who are experiencing various levels of postpartum depression. Uh, so you want to make sure that we are thinking about both the, the lactating person and the baby. However, you also want to watch out for sleepiness, uh, poor feeding, low muscle tone, or agitation. Um, and sometimes um, people who, who are taking um, during pregnancy, taking antidepressants during pregnancy, babies can sometimes seemingly have some withdrawal symptoms, which, are, which, are, which is normal. Next slide, please. Antihypertensives. Now, one thing I want you to pay attention to is looking at the lactation classification on the right side of the screen, because these are a lot of medications, and I'm not suggesting that you remember them. What I'm suggesting is that you get an idea of safety and how we should look at safety and classifications. And this is not just for the test, but for your practice going forward. So again, you can disregard the common name, but keep those things in mind. However, 
but the drug names and the drug name meaning on the far left, I took these names exactly from that core curriculum and I inserted them here. So I won't go over each one. You can see the class, but the last set of drugs, I have hydrochlorothiazide and furosemide, and you see an asterisk there. That asterisk represents, these are what's called diuretics, and some people call them water pills, which means they, they get rid of the excessive fluid that's built up from either IV fluids or just the normal physiology of pregnancy. This sometimes have the potential to reduce milk supply. And so I wanted to, I thought that was important to highlight on this slide, on this, on this slide. But, but because we have lots that are uh, to come up, I want you to just be aware that these are the names and the categories. Next slide. Vaccines, general rule, are safe for breastfeeding, except the yellow fever vaccine is not recommended. Next slide. I'm going to kick it off to Angela. Well, I have a quick question for you, Sakita. So someone yes. did ask in the chat whether or not they need to know the different uh, the different specific medications or if they just need to know the name and the purpose of them. So what would you what would you suggest? I would suggest having a familiarity with safety and concepts of safety around medication and counseling. Um, I don't think that it's important to remember exact names because then it would be like, what are you remembering? However, I will say, having just taken the test, I don't remember, uh, like I have a, a blank slate. So because it is in the core curriculum, those most common names, there are tons of drugs. These are the names that was mentioned in the core curriculum. So you want to have some familiarity and as well as the safety and counseling piece. Excellent. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm Angela, and so I'm going to go... The, the the goal of our exam review today, we probably should have said this in the beginning, is that there are certain areas that usually will trip people up, meaning they'll have a this is these are the parts of the exam which are the most challenging and where people do not score as well. And so that's why the outline for today is the first thing is on medication. So we wanted to make sure to cover that. But then the next part is breastfeeding beyond this first month. And for those of you who do work in a hospital setting and or support the newborns or that perinatal period, you may not see some of the next topics that I'm going to mention in these next few slides. And so when counseling clients with older nurslings, be mindful that the number of feedings and the time uh, at the breast may fluctuate greatly. Babies will return to, could they, they could return to intense breastfeeding to adjust to their parents' milk production as needed, which is sometimes referred to as growth spurts. They often occur around two to three weeks, six weeks, and then again at around three to four months. This coincidentally corresponds with a shift in the maternal hormones with the gradual transition from endocrine to autocrine control of milk production. So also understand that developmental milestones may increase night waking and nursing. So these little ones, are they're really too busy to look around at the world around them to actually take time and sit down and, and spend some time at the breast. So they're worried that they're going to miss something. Therefore, they don't nurse as frequently during the day, but they want to make up for lost time to ensure they get the appropriate caloric intake, intake in the middle of the night. Also notice that latch and positioning technique is quite a bit more flexible after those first few months. Note in the picture here the baby is further away from the breast than when the baby's a newborn. Unless the parent is uncomfortable, there's no reason to suggest any sort of change in the position or latch. So here we have a breast and nipple pain algorithm. So breast and nipple pain are two challenges that uh, some parents face while lactating. And so this is actually a portion of a 13 page algorithm, which was developed by the University of North Carolina 
uh, for breast and nipple pain. It's a valuable resource and a good review prior to the exam for how to identify many of the causes of this sort of discomfort. And so this is actually one of the handouts if you want to download the handouts, which are in the the two PDFs, which are part of your um, which are part of the packet. You can just click on it if you go over to handouts. You can click on it. And you can download those PDFs. They will also be part of the um, of the recording, which is actually on our website. Oh, got to go back. So here, in mastitis. So this, it's an infectious, remember mastitis is an infectious process in the breast that produces localized tenderness, redness, and heat together with systemic reactions of fever and malaise. Prospective studies estimate the incidence to be between 3 and 20 percent, depending on the definition and the length of follow-up time postpartum. Technically, mastitis is an inflammation of the breast, which may or may not involve an infection. The problem can begin with engorgement, then non-infective mastitis, followed by infective mastitis to abscess if treatment is not introduced promptly. So symptoms include a fever of 38.5 degrees centigrade or 101 Fahrenheit, chills, headache, flu-like body aches and symptoms. The breast area is painful and swollen. The breast area also could be red or hot or tender to the touch. And in a lighter skin tone, you may see redness. You may see streaks or bruising of the breast tissue. And I just want to point out in this, you know, in this person, you'll notice, and I'm putting my cursor over this area, which it just seems like this sort of general redness and blotchiness, which it may be difficult to actually see, but understand that this sort of, um, this sort of, of discoloration of the skin is what you're looking for if you don't see that bright redness that you may see on lighter skin tones. Treatment for mastitis, the first one is rest. It really cannot be overlooked, nor can it be downplayed. You want the parent to continue to feed or pump on the affected side. This is not a time to continue with weaning if the parent is cho has chosen an abrupt weaning. They need to go backwards a little bit and they need to treat and allow the milk to flow in order for the mastitis to clear. Warm compresses can help. Creative nursing positions. One little trick that you may not be aware of is that if there's a plug duct in the breast or if there is mastitis, if you can point the baby's nose or chin towards that area that's affected, the baby can work it out so much better than the parent can or any pump can as well. So those creative uh, positions are helpful. You want to, of course, encourage supportive compliance uh, if antibiotics are prescribed and the use of analgesic or anti-inflammatories for discomfort, fever, and swelling. Recurrent mastitis. So this is something as defined in the breastfeeding atlas as uh, Staphylococcus aureus is cited by Dr. Ruth Lawrence. Here I refer to the Atlas, and now I refer to Dr. Ruth Lawrence's books, uh, Breastfeeding a Guide for the Medical Profession. And it's a common cause of breast infection, staph is. Jimenez in 2015 found that staph aureus dominated the microbiome of mastitis sufferers. However, staph aureus was found by Kvist in 2008 and Tina in 2016 in the milk of asymptomatic women. In the case of recurrent mastitis, so the causes are going to be uh, are going to include delayed or inadequate treatment of the initial disease and continued milk stasis. The diagnosis can be made with a culture of milk and an infant nasopharynx or oropharynx swab. And treatment options and a thorough discussion can be found on the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine's website, specifically protocol number four on mastitis. So with the breast abscess, a smaller percentage of breast infections will develop an abscess. Kinley et al. in the late 90s reported the incidence to be around 5 to 10 percent, whereas Amir in 2004 reported about 3 percent of women with mastitis in her sample developed an abscess. One theory is that healthcare providers are more educated in the prevention of abscesses. Dr. Lawrence reports an increase in an abscess rate when antibiotic treatment was delayed beyond 24 hours. An abscess is a localized collection of pus that forms from an infection that has no opening for drainage. The indications for an abscess are the same as mastitis, although symptoms may be less severe because the abscess is isolated from the rest of the breast. This picture demonstrates an obvious abscess. 
Occasionally, an abscess can occur in the absence of any systemic symptoms, and I actually have seen that clinically on several times. Several times. So, as far as treatment options are concerned, uh, Cataria in 2013 reviewed for smaller abscesses of less than three centimeters. The recommended first line of treatment is a fine needle aspiration, single or repeated, preferably under ultrasound guidance. For abscesses greater than three centimeters, a percutaneous suction catheter can be placed for three to seven days with oral antibiotic effective against penicillin resistant staphylococci for 10 days. And for larger abscesses, the healthcare provider will incise and drain the area. A drain is placed to promote drainage. The incision heals from the inside out, usually within a week or two. A parent may continue to nurse on one or both breasts, depending on the location associated with the pain as well as the medication. So pregnancy during uh, while a person is nursing can, can occur. And it's important during these times that you want to explore the parent's feelings about continued breastfeeding. Uh, some parents will note nipple and or breast discomfort. Some will report that that discomfort actually alerted them to the fact that there was pot potentially a new pregnancy. So depending on the age and nursing relationship, some nurslings may be reluctant to wean. Mature milk will change back to colostrum at around four to five months into the pregnancy, which may change the taste of the, of the milk as well as the quantity. Oxytocin is released during nursing. However, the oxytocin is blocked by progesterone in case there are any uh, people, any healthcare providers that are concerned that nursing through pregnancy could be a risk for preterm labor. There really is no need to wean that nursling baby or child unless there is a true risk of preterm labor. There's actually limited data which shows the impact to the parent's nutritional status by continuing to nurse through pregnancy. Therefore, it's important that the parent is mindful of their diet. And some older babies or toddlers will actually stop nursing during the pregnancy, but then they resume afterwards. Now, when they resume afterwards, this is called tandem nursing. And uh, the great, uh, one of the founders of the profession, Shelley Marmet, says that it takes the patience of Job to tandem nurse. And so the definition of tandem nursing is that describes the breastfeeding of two siblings that were not born at the same time or are of different ages. It occurs when the mother nurses through the pregnancy or if a previous child weaned during the pregnancy, they may be interested in resuming. It's important to explore the parents' feelings about tandem nursing. As one, um, as I mentioned, you know, Shelley mentioned that uh, it takes the patience of Job, and so she may not feel comfortable nursing both children. Uh, she may feel some women have described it as they feel irritated or annoyed. It's almost like they're they're pushing that older child away a little bit and really wanting to focus on that new baby. And so it's important to explore those feelings and try to help the parent to find ways to cope with the feelings that they're having. In those early few days, if there's an issue with the infant's weight, ensure that the newborn is given priority at the breast. Uh, some parents will dedicate one breast to the newborn and the other to the toddler, and then switch the next day. Uh, you note here that the uh, older sibling has her arm around her new brother. And so it may be a challenge to fit everyone on the parent's lap, but it also can be um, this delightful sign of affection. So if a parent expresses a need to wean, it's, it's also important here to explore those reasons. Some families believe that weaning may increase a child's independence or help a child to sleep more at night, which may not be achieved through weaning. Gradual weaning works best for both parent and baby. It reduces the risk of severe breast pain and mastitis. In several texts on nursing a toddler, the first suggestion is don't offer the breast and don't refuse a child's request to nurse. You could eliminate a feeding every two to three days, preferably not those back-to-back -back feedings. And you want to continue as both the parent and the child accommodate this new routine. Hand express for comfort is needed and change the daily routines for the child so that alternatives to nursing are offered and explored. Other foods, other drinks, just before those regular nursing sessions. And if, for example, there's a certain chair that the parent is always nursing in or someplace on the couch, then suggest that they not necessarily spend time in that, in that area or in that chair, because that could remind the child that that's the place where they go for, for nursing. 
and of course when asked do you want to breastfeed but possibly breastfeed for shorter times so you can make the suggestion you know any sort of a distraction which may distract the child and encourage them not to nurse or maybe to continue later okay so now we're going to uh, talk about a milk supply so for those of you who took the LER courses, this picture is a familiar one. It is the neuroendocrine reflex arc, and it's to remind you of the physiological mechanism of lactation. So milk synthesis is a complex interplay of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadinal <laughs> I apologize, I don't mean to chuckle. Gonadinal access. Milk synthesis is related to the degree of breast fullness. Suckling or expression or other nipple stimulation stimulates prolactin secretion and the release of oxytocin. It's milk removal that enables milk secretion to continue. So unsubstantiated low milk production is also known as perceived insufficiency. It's a common reason for supplementing in the early days and or weaning. There is a common perception that a sleeping or quiet baby is a happy baby. Parents may, in, may misinterpret the baby's lack of settling post-feed as a sign that the baby isn't, quote, getting enough, and they may supplement. Parents may interpret normal, normal newborn nighttime circadian rhythms as a sign that the baby is hungry and assume a lack of milk. They may also assume that a baby who feeds frequently or for long durations as the baby not transferring adequately and assume that there's a lack of milk versus understanding appropriate suckling and more important swallowing to indicate milk transfer. Of course, supplementation can cause an inappropriate calibration of the breasts, leading to an actual low milk production. So it's important to discuss the objective reasons for the parent believing that the baby isn't getting enough, as well as what are those things that they can look at to know that their baby is doing just fine. So appropriate prenatal education is a piece of this, which includes no normal newborn behavior, the normal course of breastfeeding, and can help to avoid the supplementation by the family. Talking about those small nutritional requirements of the newborn, the belly balls that some people will use, or some sort of helpful infographic to convey this concept, and remind them that a baby is born full, not empty. They're swallowing amniotic fl fluid throughout the pregnancy. Therefore, hunger is not a concept that they know. Normal newborn circadian rhythms or how babies are awake for those first two to three hours after birth, followed by more sleep than expected during the subsequent 20 hours. Night waking in the first week or two is very normal and is considered, and when you consider the baby's sleep wake patterns, which are the opposite of the parent. Think about it. During the day, the parent, the pregnant parent, as they're working, as they're tending to other children, as they're shopping and such, they're rocking their baby to sleep. At night, when they stop moving, that's when the baby is awake. Therefore, the baby's circadian rhythm is the opposite of the parents. Letting them know this information may help them to adjust and adapt in those early days when the baby seems to be awake all night long. And it actually really does help quite a bit as well to engage them and chat with them as to how they can manage this reality of life. Those, the baby is going to be awake in those early days and in the nights after birth. And so how can they manage? And so talking about how the, the breastfeeding family can manage it, as well as the supportive people that are there after the birth, can really help to make that transition much easier. So this again is another slide that you may have seen. It's on failed lactogenesis. So according to Margaret Neville and Jane Morton, failed lactogenesis can be described as preglandular, glandular, and postglandular. So true failed lactogenesis can come from these three sources. And the problem uh, can be described an example for example uh, an example of preglandular could be hormonal causes such as a retained placenta or lack of pituitary prolactin glandular causes may be surgical procedures such as reduction mammoplasty or possibly insufficient mammary tissue and postglandular would be any cause for ineffective or infrequent milk removal this would include iatrogenic causes of lactation failure 
and those which are impacted by policies and procedures in a hospital or by healthcare providers, which can have a negative impact on milk production. A parent's perception of milk supply in the early hours and days after birth could also be included here. So we're looking here at structural issues. So anomalies of maternal breast tissue include surgical interruptions in the breast, such as a biopsy, a reduction or augmentation, a chest tube, which is placed when the parent was a preterm baby, or a thoracotomy prior to breast development, breast asymmetry, which includes intramammary distance or the space between two breasts. All of those things can be signs of structural issues which could negatively impact milk production. So when we look at maternal disease, we're looking at hypo or hyperthyroidism, lupus, Parkinson's, diabetes, hypertension, acute illness or birth-related complications, including hemorrhage after birth, especially causing large or a sudden drop in blood pressure and or requiring a blood transfusion. As a point of reference, just for those of you who may not have it at top of mind, 500 milliliters is a normal blood loss. Hemorrhage may cause damage to the pituitary, ranging from, mild, from a mild insult to a major infarction. Sheehan syndrome is a severe hemorrhage and a drop in blood pressure that may result in necrosis of the intuitary pituitary, anterior pituitary. Hormonal issues were referred to a few slides ago and are worth mentioning again. So, and actually they're irregular menses, infertility, obesity-related issues, PCOS, Weight loss surgery, specifically gastric bypass, can impact the amount of nutrient absorption. So here we have pacifiers. So this reminds us of those postglandular reasons for insufficient milk. So it's anything that would cause ineffective or infrequent milk removal. There are iatrogenic reasons for lactation failures, such as separation of the parent and baby, pacifier use, perceived insufficient milk by staff or family, which leads to supplementation. Interventions which require supplementation and milk supply, which is not simultaneously supported through hand expression or pumping, can cause this issue. So consider the supplementation scenario. Parents are told they have to supplement their baby and they may feel that breastfeeding has failed and they worry about the resumption. Well-meaning healthcare providers may not encourage the resumption of breastfeeding if those interventions such as supplementation were effective. Common scenarios include a baby diagnosed with hyperbilirubinemia in the early days after birth and supplementation with breast milk substitutes or and with breast milk substitutes is begun. Or a two-week-old baby who wasn't gaining effectively, they begin to gain with supplementation. So in both of these cases, the parents may be afraid to resume exclusive breastfeeding and healthcare providers may not have the time to create a care plan to help the baby to return to exclusive breastfeeding. Finally, there are some cultural beliefs that create a barrier to normal breastfeeding, such as colostrum not being enough or bad for the baby. Other factors uh, could be, you know, we could spend quite a bit of time on each one of these specific issues, but we're looking here for those factors which will delay lactogenesis uh, greater than 72 hours. So premature delivery, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus or gestational diabetes, Metabolic status or health refers to an interesting study from Namsen Rivers, Donal, and Huang in 2012, which describes three risk factors for delayed lactogenesis. Higher BMI or overweight obesity, increased maternal age, and larger infant birth weight, known as correlates with carbohydrate intolerance and systemic inflammation. Obesity alone is a risk factor for delayed lactogenesis too, for a variety of reasons, including obese women have higher risk for C-section and bearing of a large infant. Gestational diabetes is more prevalent in obese women than in overweight women. Mechanical difficulties may exist in positioning and latching an infant onto a large breast. I've often heard women describe that they don't know what to do with all of this breast tissue, and they're concerned about latching the baby onto the breast when the baby is so small and the breast just seems so large in comparison. Maternal obesity may be associated with metabolic or steroidal hormonal alterations that affect the, ability, the breast's ability to initiate and produce milk. So there's one study that demonstrated that obese women had lower prolactin responses to suckling. 
a blunted pro prolactin response to suckling in the early days when lactation is being established may not only delay lactogenesis too, but may also establish low levels of milk production, leading to early supplementation and premature weaning. Weaning. So other factors for this delayed lactogenesis too is hypertension, high levels of stress to the parent or fetus during the birth, cesarean birth, especially when it's urgent, prolonged stage two of labor, so that's greater than an hour, augmentation of labor with intravenous fluids and oxytocin, forceps or a vacuum delivery. The timing of the first breast stimulation following delivery, if it's, for example, within that first hour after birth, or if hand expression didn't occur until five or six hours later, significant edema of the extremities, and endocrine disturbances. So the point here is that it, there are complex interrelationships which exist among the various factors that may affect lactogenesis. Whether the delay of lactogenesis too is a maternal physiological response due to delayed or ineffective suckling or a combination of factors, it's not been clearly identified. Early, frequent, and effective breastfeeding appears to be the most important factor in establishing normal lactation. And frankly, I would argue that skin to skin and milk expression in the first hours after birth are key factors to consider to counter those possible risk, risk factors. So for those of you who do work in a hospital setting, you can understand how all of these things can be impeded with any of the above diagnoses. Now, it's not just the, the parent or the mother's role that affects milk production. It's also the infant has a part in this as well. So any issues which affect sucking or suckling frequency may affect the initiation and calibration of milk production. The baby may not be capable of sufficient milk removal to initiate and maintain adequate supply. So important factors here are gestational age, Premature infants, of course. Remember that the late preterm infant may not suckle well enough for adequate milk removal. The infant's oral and facial anatomy. Any tongue mobility restriction can impact not only maternal nipple discomfort, but also the ability to remove milk. Palatal issues obviously include a partial or complete cleft of the hard or soft palate, but also a high bubble or channel palate and airway issues such as laryngomalacia and tracheomalacia. So long-term, the issues on the previous slide can impact the initiation and calibration of that supply. The following are, can impact the maintenance of milk production, such as infant hypotonia or hypertonia, birth trauma pain, such as shoulder dystocia or the use of a forceps or vacuum, cardiac or respiratory issues, and long-term impact can be infant facial anomalies, anomalies such as on the t with the tongue or the palate, and sensory integration issues, which will frankly not be so apparent in those first few days and weeks. Prenatal education can reduce the risk of the use of supplementation in the early days by the parents who believe the baby isn't getting enough. During the hospital stay, it's really important to include as part of your solution. Frequent skin-to-skin -skin contact, you really can't overdo it. Also, colostrum and milk removal, hand expression seems to work best. Here's a quick note for parents who are pumping for their premature infant or who are having trouble extracting an appropriate amount. Utilization of the other senses can help the mother with the milk ejection reflex. A study noted an improvement of milk output when the parent was either looking at pictures of the baby and or listening to a baby's cry or cues, as well as smelling their t-shirt or blanket from the day before. So also it's important to give them the anticipatory guidance on the normal newborn circadian rhythms, those visuals of the stomach size again, and realistic expectations. If supplementation is required, really talking about those alternative supplementation techniques and close follow-up are all necessary. Okay, that was quick. And so now we're going to turn just for a moment and take a look at variables in experimental studies. So research is another topic which you want to make sure that you know some of these key terms. So the dependent variable is what the independent variable acted upon. For example, in a study on breast pumps, the volume of breast milk obtained when using several types of pumps was compared. The volume of milk is the dependent variable and the type of pumps is the independent variable. 
confounding variables in this example might be the privacy of the place that the parent used to pump, and that may lower the amount they obtain, or the time of day could be a confounding variable. And then quickly to review some of these uh, important terms. So the standard deviation is a measure of how spread out the numbers are. So 68% will fall in the first standard deviation. 95% will fall into the first and second standard deviation. 99.7% will fall into the first, second, and third standard deviation. And then there's just going to be a few in that fourth standard deviation. Statistical significance is the level of certainty in the results of a study. If we want to be 99% confident of our results, we set the significance level at 0 0.01. If we want to be 95% confident of our results, we set the significance level at 0 0.05, which is most medical research. I want to take a quick note to point out the term of bias. So there are different types of bias which can influence research. For example, a piece of research looks at the effectiveness of a breast pump, specifically the frequency of the number of cycles per minute. You note, when you're reading the research, that the university who supported it is funded by a specific breast pump company. The researcher whose university receives funding from that pump company could be biased in their study design and or the interpretation of the results. Another concept on the slide is informed cons consent. So that includes the subject's need to be informed about their rights, equipment or medications used, procedures, confidentiality, and withdraw from a study at any time and any rewards for participation. Okay, so Sakita, now we're gonna move into the, the questions section. Do you think we should answer some of the questions that have come in first or should we dive right into the questions? For the interest of time, I think we should dive into the question. I am answering the questions in the chat, uh, which has all been about, actually, this is a question that you may be able to answer because uh, someone asked, was the increased maternal weight or age, is that a typo regarding delayed lactogenesis too? So I answered that, but also lots of questions about delayed. Uh, lactogenesis and what is considered a higher maternal age for delayed lactogenesis. Uh, so when you talked about if you could just clarify those points before moving on otherwise everything else is taken care of. So when we're looking at uh, a higher maternal age I believe in the um, obstetric world and correct me if I'm wrong Sakita I believe it's over the age of 35 or is it 33 now and yeah, it's either 33 or 35, and it, they have this terrible term. It's called advanced maternal age. It's also known as a geriatric pregnancy or, or geriatric, uh, which really just blows my mind. So that could be um, that advanced maternal age. Um, and we are talking about weight. We're looking at higher BMIs, um, and that is something which is a risk factor as well. Am I missing anything on that one, Sakita? No, the one thing I want to caution about is is, is uh, the actual concept of the advanced maternal age, simply because I was just looking at breastfeeding in human lactation, and uh, I was shocked to see 30 there as for uh, greater than or, e um, I'm sorry, older than 30 or equal to 30. And so the number is getting lower and lower. I would say <laughs> uh, just know that advanced maternal age. I don't think there's so much variance in the definitions of where you fall in the category, depending on what you're talking about. So I would say that is a term that can be used safely and um, just know that. I don't think there's a magic number uh, because that that struck me as odd because I remember reading somewhere else where 40 for breast milk uh, and I think I don't know if it was a study but I remember the age 40 uh, and I was I was 40 uh, almost 40 when I had my last one so I was like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> yes there that's true go. So, and, and one thing I want to note is, is that, you know, I worked once with a client who um, at 54 years of age had her first child. 
And so we all know those outliers. Remember that the test is not testing on the outliers. So just because you knew one person who was able to bring in a good milk supply with that first pregnancy at the age of 54, that's an outlier. And so when you're taking the exam, you wanna think of the majority as opposed to the outliers. Okay, so now we are going to bring up some questions here and we, which I know is your favorite part here. And we're also going to have a poll. So give us just one, give me just one moment here and I am going to, all right, so here you go. Here are these questions. Here's this question, a medical condition which, which has been indicated in delayed lactogenesis is, so go ahead. I'll give everybody about 30 seconds. Okay. So, Sharing the responses here, and 78% said it was obesity. And there were a few good, um, there are a few good distractors here, right, Sakita? So the distractors, I don't know if you can yes. see these results, but the distractors, of course, are the placental abruption and hyperthyroid. Yep. So why is it not hyperthyroid? Are you talking to me? <laughs> Why is I it not? Yes. So, so uh, it, it could be hyperthyroid, yeah. but it's probably not going to be hyperthyroid, right? It's probably going to be hypothyroid, and Correct. and and also in those first few days and weeks after birth, um, what usually that that everything is 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 so is fluctuating so greatly that yeah. it's probably not going to be hyperthyroidism. It's probably going to be obesity first if you had to take a look at which one is probably the larger reason for the delay, which has been uh, for delayed lactogenesis too, it's going to be the obesity. Right, the other things though, as far as distractor is, and I can see how some people might be thinking placental abruption because you're thinking blood loss, right? Try not to read into the question. It, the question gives you exactly what it's asking for, but I can definitely see how some people might be thinking, oh, blood loss, abruption, uh, depending on, again, people are taking this test from a wide range of backgrounds, and so you want to keep that in mind as well. Excellent. Okay, good. Okay, next question. I'm actually going to... Share it first. So physical breast presentation, which may contribute to low milk supply. This is that one that I was like, oh, tricky, <laughs> tricky. It is, <laughs> it is. The, the distractors are just like blaring at you. Yes, yes. <laughs> And so it's it's tough because that you've got two different terms, infra memory yes. fold and intra memory yes. distance. Okay, so the so you have to understand what those words are. Um, nobody's fallen for breast cup size less than a B. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, and hypoplasia of the superior breast tissue. So think of those medical terminology, right? What is superior? Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and close and share. Okay, so okay. pretty good. And so it is significant intramammary distance. So the difference between the two breasts is what, if you've got that spacing there, that's what is something that is going to, um, could be a physical uh, breast presentation, but remember it may contribute, but it doesn't always contribute. So you don't want to see that spacing in a person during your first visit and say, oh, that's it, and you know, because that's not necessarily it. So just wanna, just wanna say, if you see something in that case in those early days, don't say something. Don't necessarily say something. Okay, next question. Here we go. I think that we just had this question, Angela. 
I think so too. Okay. <laughs> Let me close this poll. Y'all are going to get it right. Okay. <laughs> IBLCE will not have that. Okay. Just want to say IBLCE won't have that. Okay. Here we go. And we're launching a post glandular reason for insufficient milk production. So post glandular. Yep. I was going to say just that. Think about post and think about glandular. Give you another few seconds. Okay. Okay, so here we go. So pacifier or dummy use. <laughs> it is known as a dummy in some parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, retained placenta. So it's not retained placenta because that's something that actually is is that happened during that birth. So this is a post glandular. So a retained placenta is not part of, is not the actual physical structure of the breast. Am I explaining that right, Sakita? I hear it, but uh, that would be for the audience. Uh, we'll see, I'll see if thou, I have any questions about that, let's see. That's true. And then a previous breast biopsy with periareolar incision is not it because that was prior to. So that is something that's going to be um, preglandular. Okay, so someone made a comment that said, I don't completely understand this and why not C? Right. Uh, so we, again, mm -hmm. remember when I said post glandular, right? Has to do with what is happening after. Right. I agree. And actually in the handouts, in one of the handouts, I actually included that slide on preglandular, postglandular. Um, I actually included that in your slides, in your handouts. So hopefully you will um, have a chance to take a look at that. Yeah. And the answer of why not retain placenta, um, retain placenta is biologically what happens. That's a whole different and I would say pathology of the rationale for insufficient milk supply. So it would not fall under postglandular. Okay, good. Okay. So now this one I'm gonna I'm gonna preface it. There's a warning right here. This next one is a little challenging. So here you go. So you're taking a look at the medications. You've got both the trade and the generic names here. That's another second or two. Okay. So here, most of you got it right. So ex experience excessive blood loss. So yes, that's accurate. So they receive synthetic oxy oxytocin as well as in the United States known as methogen after this vaginal delivery. So they experienced an excessive blood loss. So the first line medication for use in the management of excessive blood loss during the third and fourth stages of labor is Pitocin. If bleeding does not decrease, a second medication is indicated. Providers may choose among several second line medications, including Methogen. A is not correct because management of normal blood loss does not require two medications. C is not correct because the delivery of twins does not require two medications. D is incorrect because excessive blood loss does not necessarily mean breastfeeding will be unsuccessful. And that is actually one of the new questions that we're going to have at LER. So I'm really grateful to the person who, uh, who created that for us. 
I want to just say about that that question about will not be able to breastfeed. I'm sorry, the answer option. Remember, I just talked about medications and I said most medications are relatively safe. Um, there are some caveats, right? And there's the ways of, of thinking about things. Um, so you want to just be make sure you understand that concept. Remember I said that the, you, won't, you wouldn't be able to breastfeed if you were on chemotherapy, radioactive. So remember that from that uh, lens and that frame, framework from that slide and you'll have that in your handout as well. Great, okay. The next question here is we have Lilo Lactation Consultant. She did a study in their hospital where they were surveying the patient, parents' duration of breastfeeding. They found the range was one to eight, one week to 18 months with a mean of eight months. What type of research is this? Another second or so. Okay, and so the answer is quantitative. It is based on data. It's not experimental and it does not attempt to determine causality. There we go. Sorry. That's helpful. Well, while we're looking at results, I do want to address something that someone just uh, said. Uh, you, they said, you said you wouldn't need to know the names <laughs> of individual medications. So I want to be clear that you won't have to know the trade name, which is that middle column. But the, the drugs that I listed on that left side, the first column, those are the drug names that were taken from the core curriculum book, so those names. So what I was meaning was that you wouldn't have to know both. I took them from the core curriculum straight out of there. And so I hope that makes sense and clarifies. She just said thanks, so I think that does. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so next question is another research question. Lilo Lactation Consultant is a, has time for research and did another study in her hospital where she surveyed patients about their satisfaction with breastfeeding and what problems they encountered. What type of research is this? And you see, it's interesting because you, one thing that IBLC tries not to do is to give you one question and then give you another question, which could help you to answer the question before or the, another question in the, the exam itself. And so this has been really easy because this question, and most of you have voted, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this. Uh, most of you got it, that it's qualitative, and that is correct. And the reason why it's qualitative is because, as, it, as I mentioned before, we're exploring reality-based perceptions considering multiple perspectives and no attempt at causality. Again, so this is just that sort of patient satisfaction piece. So we're looking at qualitative. So understand that IBLC though is not going to, you know, you may not necessarily give you, uh, they may not be quite so easy. They do understand that part. Okay, next question. Iron levels are low in breast milk. What instructions should you give to parents? So what's interesting about this one is breastfeed no supplementation needed is, I'm gonna go ahead and say it, that is accurate. However, look at the next one. Breastfeed and supplement at six months with iron fortified foods. Let's see if y'all can change answers here.
Okay, I'm going to two more seconds, close it out. Okay, so yes, breastfeed and supplement at six months with iron fortified foods. So that is the correct answer. Uh, it's interesting that specifically with iron, increasing the mother's intake of iron will not increase her the iron levels in breast milk, even if the parent if the mother is anemic. So, and iron supplements taken by the parent may produce constipation in the baby. Anemia in the nursing mother has been associated with mil poor milk supply, however. So again, if we want to supplement the baby, we don't necessarily give the parent additional iron. But in order to ensure that the that the parent's iron stores are sufficient, that's why we want to um, make sure that they're eating the right amount of iron for themselves, but they can't necessarily increase the amount of iron in their diet in order to increase the iron in breast milk. It's one of those things that the body controls for. Okay. Next question is about vitamin D. And I would not be surprised if there's a vitamin D question on the exam, just because it's such a hot topic, I believe, in, in areas all around the world. So notice again, we've got two questions. or two answers that are relatively similar. And it's interesting, my, I don't know about you, Sakita, but my opinion of breastfeeding has, or of supplementation of vitamin D has changed over the years with the, with the current evidence. Yeah, I believe the ABM, right, has a protocol mm -hmm. about what's, needed for vitamins. Mm -hmm. um, hint, hint, if you are, or ABM protocols are actually free. Yes. Um, so that's the good thing. So their website is bfmed.org. And so here's the answer. So yes, babies should be supplemented with 400 IUs of vitamin D every day. Yep. Now, spending a half an hour in the sun outdoors, the challenge with that is that um, on what uh, latitude is the baby and the parent? And we're also looking at, you know, the um, ba babies from around the world are not the same. And therefore, we need to, you know, be mindful of that, is that, that it may be something that you wanted to do. Uh, that you may want want to recommend to your clients, but yet you're remember you want you want to take a look at around the world. What would be the recommendation around the world? And I do believe that it is a global recommendation to do the 400 IU's of vitamin D every day. There is someone who said something in the chat uh, that WHO states that vitamin D is not needed, so we will look that up just to make sure that we are correct on this one as far as the WHO is concerned. But I do believe that the babies do need to be supplemented with 400 IU's of vitamin D a day. Okay, next question. Again, I will mention that this one may be a little challenging. Mm. And so the question is, which of the following viruses is most likely to be transmitted to the infant through breast milk from an impar infected parent? So we have hepatitis C, herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus, and cytomegalovirus. So while we're waiting, someone says, at what point would this be prescribing? Um, as lactation consultants, without having an additional license to do so, you would not be prescribing. It is just uh, one of those things that you should know about uh, infant feeding and lactation when it comes to breastfeeding. Um, 
I, I hope that, that that answers. We're not suggesting that you prescribe and tell parents to, to put their babies on vitamin D. It's just that you should be aware that that is a recommendation. Right. And so here we've got these different viruses. So the answer is C. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, D, cytomegalovirus. Transmission from parent to infant occurs in 60 to 70% of breastfeeding dyads where the breastfeeding parent is infected with CMV. However, healthy infants who acquire the infection in this manner are, also, are almost always asymptomatic and breastfeeding should be encouraged. Premature infants and immunosuppressed infants are at higher risk of complications from CMV infection. And there is debate about whether these infants should receive CMV positive breast milk. Herpes simplex virus and hepatitis C are unlikely to be transmitted via breast milk. Zaricella zoster, varicella zoster virus, excuse me, causes chickenpox and zoster. Infected parents should be encouraged to breastfeed. The infant should be protected from direct contact with skin lesions. So notice that the key here is that virus is transmitted to the infant through breast milk. And so that's why the CMV is the correct answer. Okay, great. All right, next question. And to the person who asked how long does the infant need vitamin D supplementation, I the what I read was two years, but I believe it depends on if you are providing foods that are um, rich in vitamin D. Oh, I didn't launch it, sorry. The primary reason, you guys can't answer. The primary reason for supplying breast milk for premature infants is to... And BF is breastfeeding and CF is chest feeding. There's another question that wants clarification on what they need to know about the drug name or common name. Um, what's important to understand is that middle column on the table. Drugs have many names. There is the actual generic, well, the actual name of the drug, but then different companies, you know, name the medication different names. And so those, that middle column, again, is very flexible and fluid. There's several names for drugs. What you wanna know, again, is the first column those are the drug names um, that are listed in the core curriculum. Excellent. Okay. And this one, we really couldn't fool you too much in that most of you got preventing neck, and that is correct. Necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay, good. The primary reason for supplying breast milk to premature infants. Okay, next question. Give you a preview. The risk of skin to skin care in the newborn infants include So there is a sophisticated distractor here, for sure. Give me just another second or two. I think this one is a tougher one because of that distractor. And I actually just changed this question yesterday. Mm. So the answer is sudden unexpected postnatal collapse. It's something which does occur in those first few hours after birth. 
and if you want to know more about SUPC, I highly recommend that you read read up on it. While sudden unexpected postnatal collapse can lead to sudden unexpected infant death, the answer is the postnatal collapse piece for the infant. Um, respiratory instability is not correct because instability means that it's unstable, right? So skin to skin, uh, so that's not a that's not a risk skin to skin improves respiratory stability. Therefore, that's not a risk. And then hypothermia, the baby being too cold, that is not a risk of skin to skin. Actually, skin to skin stabilizes the baby's temperature. And so that's where you, SUPC would have been the correct answer. Okay, got a few more. Okay, this technique is useful for all infants except, oh, and I just realized you can't see. Oh, yeah. So there. Like, so, so that doesn't help, does it? So y'all can't do that. Okay. There it goes. So There's I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. So this is the picture. This technique is useful for all infants except. Now, do you understand that IBLCE is doing their best to get rid of negative STEM questions? It doesn't mean there won't be one, but... Um, this technique is useful for all infants except premature infants, Down syndrome infants, neurological impairment, and infants with type 3 ankyloglossia. So the answer is type 3 ankyloglossia. So what's happening here is the parent is utilizing their thumb and their forefinger in order to stabilize the, their breasts in order to stabilize to hold the breast, but also to stabilize the baby's cheeks. And so babies with neurologic impairment, babies with Down syndrome who may be hypotonia, uh, uh, may have hypotonia, uh, premature infants all could use that additional support of the parents' index and thumb, index fingers and thumbs around their jaw, around their chin in order to support their that musculature. And so that's why the one uh, group that will not, um, this technique is not useful, is for babies with type 3 ankyloglossia. Now, of course, that's their, the I'm sorry, what go ahead. What did the poll show? How did, how many people? Well, we couldn't do the poll because oh, we they couldn't, yes, picture, you, because we couldn't yeah. do it at the same time. So yeah, got it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, um, but I will say that uh, that I included um, ankyloglossia because you know you think that that's the answer for everything, right? So. <laughs> And it was the answer in this case, and that's one of the hand, this hand position isn't necessarily uh, support those those babies. Okay, now here we have WHO guidelines for the preparation of powdered infant formula. I think you can change your answer with this, with these, because you take a look at it. Somebody's asking if they need to know the different types of ankyloglossia. I typed it into the chat, but I'll tell y'all, no. Give you another few seconds. If you guys can hear me typing, I apologize. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share it. Okay, so mm. this one was a tough one. Wow. And so just want to say that the answer, the correct answer is C. Okay, so Sakita and I also, just a full disclosure, Sakita and I also work in baby-friendly hospitals. And so we know this answer cold. So the reason why, for example, A and B are not correct, it, yes, the boiling of the water is something which is important. And you need, do need to boil the bottles and teats as well as the water, but not for 20 minutes. So that's the, that's the thing that should have kicked those two out. 
and D is incorrect because 72 hours. So you can prepare powdered infant formula with the appropriate method and it will stay in refrigeration for 24 hours, not 72. So the correct answer is C, to mix the measured amount of powdered formula and hot water, and the hot water must be at this, at this temperature. And so if you see that, then that's the correct, you know, if you see that, know that that is the correct answer. If you need to know this information, if you don't have this information, by all means, please do take a look at the WHO. You can, you can Google it, powdered infant formula um, and WHO guidelines, and you should get a nice, really pr pretty um, picture of, of really pictures and an infographic that will give you this information. Okay, so I'm going to um, answer some of the questions in the chat. And Sakita, yeah. you are up now. Yes. I just um, wanted to just talk about that 158 degree Fahrenheit question because um, I can see some people like, what? <laughs> because the answers were so varied. Uh, that is for the, the rationale for it is so that it kills the chronobacter um, if it is uh, present. Powdered formula is one of those risk of uh, being regulated in some places. Um, so you wanna just be sure that we are teaching people how to, chronobacter can kill babies. So we wanna make sure that we are teaching people um, that use powdered formula the correct way to prepare it. And just a quick note also on the powdered formula, someone from the UK says, uh, we don't store, uh, in the UK, we don't recommend storing prepared um, from powdered formula. Mm -hmm. That is, I do agree. Uh, however, WHO says that it can be put in refrigeration for up to 24 hours. So indeed, that's where we need to take a look at that global view. Yes. Absolutely. So Sakita, there've been so many questions. I think some people are a little stressed here. So <laughs> what, okay. what, Let's... what can you help them with? Well, I can help them survive. They're surviving already. They got here. You are almost, and I'm going to make the assumption that most will be testing in September, um, sometime in September, right? So we've all had to pivot in ways due to the pandemic. So I'm going to provide you with just some things to keep in mind. Next slide. Okay, like I said, you got here. You are here today with us, so give yourselves a hand. You are almost to the finish line, and preparation, depending on your background, you know, can be extremely grueling for some, but I think it's grueling for all. Uh, I had to sit not too long ago, and again, having worked in a hospital, I was still stressed. So. I know that it takes passion, it takes dedication, it takes endurance, and, and I equate that to blood, sweat, and tears. That's how I say it. Um, but arriving at the exam day is a reflection of that. It's a reflection of all of that's in you. And so just be proud that you are here. And when you, when you arrive at uh, exam day, that means you've done all the pre-work to get here. So that, that's a, 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 an accomplishment in itself. Next slide. So in the last few days, you want to stay connected to this passion. You want to celebrate your dedication, be proud of your endurance and trust in your preparation. And you're here, so you are preparing right now. And so that's a great start. Next slide. So remember to breathe. This is huge. You know, sometimes we take for granted breathing, breathing, just like, okay, it's a normal everyday thing. Remember, when you get stressed, some people, they hold their breaths they, and they don't even know it. So if you're starting to feel like even today, being on this call, I bet some people are, have been holding their breath like, oh my gosh, especially if you got an answer wrong. Just remember, 
take a deep breath. And when I say breathe deeply, I talk about a technique called in for four, out for four. So breathing, and I used this when I was an, a labor nurse. Uh, so breathing in for four and out for four, and I'm telling you, it works. I mean, four seconds of breathing in, that nice cleansing breath, and then it should take you four seconds to exhale. Next slide. So there are lots of things to do to prepare for just the exam day. Because this exam is an international exam, because this exam will be on the computer, and because this, you're, you have a three-week window uh, that this exam will be open, I just want you to keep those principles in mind. But you want to prepare. You want to have your confirmation number from your email. Um, I say have it in another place, write it down. I mean, the email is there, but make sure you have it. Make sure you know what to expect for the video. There, um, on the following slides, I'm gonna talk about um, the requirements for your computer, but know that you can't test on a tablet. And, and that is from the Prometric, Prometric website. Um, you need a stable internet connection. Um, like now for me, right now I'm presenting and I'm presenting and I don't want it to disconnect. So I connect to my ethernet. I don't rely on Wi-Fi. Uh, and so you wanna make sure that you have a stable internet connection so that nothing's gonna happen. You're not gonna get this little, your network is breaking up and then it, that's probably one of the worst things that can happen. Um, security measures, make sure there are three security checks and so Prometric has a video on their website. If you have not seen the video, it's very short, but it talks about there are security measures that there that are in place. Um, even though you're taking this at home, there it's very um, kind of top-notch proctoring that's going to be happening. And also, know do you know if you can take breaks or not? According to the website, that there it's no, but. There is a link in that email that you received, and I believe Angela posted the 20-page uh, PDF uh, for understanding what's expected on the day of. I recommend that you read that in its entirety, and don't skim it, read it, because this is very important. You got here, and let's just make it happen. All right, next slide. So remember I said that there are some computer system requirements. You're looking at them. You're looking at them. So this requires installing the ProProctor application and performing a systems check. It requires a certain screen resolution, operating system, web browser. You wanna make sure that you have the latest Google Chrome and it is updated. Um, it talks about the specifications for your webcam. So. I put this here to, so that you understand about installing and reading that PDF because it's nothing like thinking, oh, I'll just do it on the, on the day of the exam. I'll just do the checks. You want to make sure. And you want to know, what do you do if you get disconnected? What does that look like? Um, and so those are the things that can be directed to Prometric or hopefully you'll be able to find in that 20-page PDF. Next slide. So before the exam day, also you wanna make sure you're alone, no pets or people. On their website, it actually says that if someone enters the room, you could, your exam can be invalidated. So plan to be alone, plan for no interruptions. You, I already talked about a, a place where your internet is strongest, but you also wanna have good lighting. Um, you want to suggest that if you have others in your home, that they stay off the internet. No streaming, no social media. You are it. It is your show for those, those four hours that you are on the computer. That's it. Everybody else can live, you know, four hours without it, right? Um, and like I said, consider your hardwire Ethernet cable um, and ensure, again, that you have quiet time, that you're able to focus, that, you know, someone's not in the next room banging pots and pans and cooking while you're trying to take an exam, because that would not, that would be distracting. Next slide, please. 
All right. This is, I love playlists. My playlist is about 15 hours long. So before exam day, there are some songs that just motivate you and this helps some people prepare. Um, build an ex playlist that's going to put a smile on your face, include some of the songs, um, or find a podcast that makes you laugh. Uh, I know all of the medical terms can sometimes seem overwhelming. You need to just kind of take a, take a step back and breathe and do some things that are also enjoyable as you lead up to this day. You can also write yourself a you can do it note, place it, place it, write yourself a you can do it note the night before the exam and put it on the refrigerator so when you wake up, it's there. Those are little things, or in your bathroom. Um, those are little things that can kind of give you, give you a confidence booster that you've prepared and you're going to do your best. Next slide. Your exam temperature. So think about what's worked for you in the past. Think about when you've had to study for a big test, what worked and what didn't work. Um, and, and modify that. Think about doing test questions. If today you, you're feeling like, whoa, hey, I didn't do so well on certain sets of questions, go back to it. But take your exam. Um, if you feel like you got a great handle on it, stick with that. If you're nervous, take some steps and think about the things that have helped you be successful in the past. Next slide. the night before the exam. Listen, the night before the exam is yours. Do not listen to a breastfeeding podcast or anything out the ordinary or still cramming. Find your inner calm, relax. The night before the exam, make sure you get a good night's rest. Um, it's Think about if you're reading that before you go to sleep, your mind is still gonna be working, working, working all night long. You wanna give your brain a rest before going into that exam, right? So just make sure that you, you find that inner calm so that you can get a good night's rest. Next slide, please. So the day you wake up, the day you wake up, you're gonna wake up to your nice little note on your either bathroom mirror or your refrigerator. When you go to the refrigerator, please eat something that you're used to. It's not time to kind of have a celebratory new type of breakfast or dinner or whatever time frame you're gonna be taking it. You wanna eat something that your body is used to. You wanna be in comfortable clothing and that the temperature in your home, you're dressed appropriately for that and trust your preparation. Um, you're ready, you're, you're absolutely ready. Next slide, please. So remember this is a set 175 total questions. There are two parts to the test. There's the multiple choice part, and then there's a, uh, the second part or the other part uh, is images. The test is four hours in duration, um, 30 extra minutes if the exam is not in your primary language, and each question has only one correct answer. There is no penalty for a wrong answer. So it's to your advantage to answer all of the questions. You wanna remember this is an international exam. I think that's the next slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? <laughs> so, yes, this is an international exam. So, so for those of us in the US, it's not specific to US. So when you think about a question about, say for example, expressing milk, what's the method? You wanna think about hand expression before pumping. Um, think about the, the universal, worldwide, global view. You also wanna review HIV, the HIV protocols. Those are things you wanna be familiar with. Again, because sometimes, and, and, and I said that for the US because I am in the US, and I know that sometimes we can be ethnocentric here, uh, but at the same token, you do wanna make sure that you think about the global implication. Read the test question. Um, you know, actually, this was funny as Angela and I was preparing 
I just skimmed the question and was like, I knew the answer, but because I was like, you know, just skimming, I, I got it wrong. So you want to make sure you read every single word. You want to eliminate the obvious wrong answers. Watch for those negative STEM questions. Angela just gave you one and she said, it will see they're trying to do away with it, but you might see it. So a negative STEM question is, is something like, what is not? Or what is least likely? Or pick everything except. You wanna make sure that you focus. If you go blank, you guess and you breathe. However, remember that the first answer that pops in your mind is usually the correct answers. Don't change the answer unless you are 100% sure that you've chosen it wrong because you know um, it may be counterproductive to do that. Next slide, please. All right, so you wanna work at a comfortable and thoughtful space. Given the fact that, that you have four hours, you do wanna um, work at a steady pace that will help you to complete the exam. You can mark any questions that you would like to review, but please answer them before moving on. You make the, your best chat and then you review if time allows. If you go blank, again, in for four, out for four. You guess and you move on. Next slide. Then you're done. You're done. You submit and you are done. So I have all kinds of done dones. Like some people are like, I'm done done. You know, I've heard that term. But yes, some people are like, yes, it's done. Some people are just like, I'm done. I'm done. That's all I got, right? And then you see the little guy over there like, I'm done. You know, so whatever done you are, once you hit submit, <laughs> You are done, right? So uh, that's it for me, Angela. Next slide. I think uh, it's a done. Oh, I know. I have. I do have one. Oh, yes. This is huge. Next slide, please. This is huge. All right. So remember, I said there's three weeks of that people will be taking exam. Please, please. The constant thinking, and I know people are in support groups online. Don't go in. Oh, I got this wrong. Or uh, uh, uh. Don't do any of that. Try not to obsess and check the IBLC website or social media. As a matter of fact, after you take the test, I would say be done with social media for a minute. Um, you know, remind yourself that you did your best. Um, but some of the other things you can do is you can stay connected to your professional community and keep learning and keep learning and start to think about once you get your certification. What's next? All right, next slide. Remember your why. Why did you do this? That's a huge, oh, your passion, your passion. I see all these beautiful people on this slide and I think about my passion and I also think about how blessed I am to be on all of the chest feeding and breastfeeding journeys that I've been along with people. It's amazing. So when all else fails, remember your why. Next slide. Thank you. Now that is the end. If you have any questions or comments, you can contact us by email. My email is slewisjohnson at lactationtraining.com or Angela is alove at lactationtraining.com. Angela, were there any questions that we need to answer before signing off? There's a couple that I just want to um, mention. Uh, one was around safe sleep. And I want to say that the Academy for Breastfeeding Medicine, yet again, has uh, a fantastic resource on safe sleep. It's got a, a fantastic global perspective, and it was recently updated. So if you're uncertain as to what safe sleep parameters uh, you should follow, I would highly recommend that you go to the ABM uh, protocol. I will say that um, that protocol, though, is something it's brand new, so specifics of the protocol are not going to be asked as one of the exam questions, um, but just to know that that's a fantastic place to go. It's bfmed.org is the website. 
So do take a look at that website, especially if there's an area that you're uncertain about. Do take a look at the website, pull down the protocol. They're all pre, they're all free. And I want to shout out to the ABM for keeping all of their protocols online and free for all of us. So they're really fantastic and wonderful. Uh, another question had to do, where can I study, get good pictures? Uh, a good place to study pictures, frankly, and I'm typing into the chat here, is the CDC. So the CDC has pictures on infant growth and development, and especially developmental milestones. And so the CDC, of course, in the United States, but they actually have pictures of infants, and they have wonderful things that show if your infant is not doing a, B, and Z by this age, then talk to your healthcare provider. But that's the wonderful thing about it is that it actually shows you what's expected at a certain time and when to be concerned. But it's nice because they have a lot of pictures. So the CDC is a good place to go for pictures. Also Stanford University, um, Dr. Jane Morton, they have a lot of good pictures of, of normal and abnormal baby things that you can review. So I don't have that link right at the top, uh, right here at the moment, but I will, I will find that information. And actually it's easy for you to Google and to find that information. It's a fantastic place to go. Um, anything else, Sakita, that you can think of? Oh, I know what I was gonna say. Um, Sakita, are there gonna be any questions on COVID on the exam? Oh no. Why? COVID, <laughs> COVID is so fluid. COVID, the evidence is all over the place. Uh, in order for us to call something evidence-based and solid, it means that you have to have had several studies that are replicated. Uh, so no, today's news changes tomorrow. If you've been watching COVID and what's happening, it won't, it won't be now. Will it be on the exam maybe five, 10 years from now? Who knows, but right now, now. But y'all don't have to worry about that because if you take the exam this time, you're not going to have to take it again unless you decide you want to take it again. I think that will still be an option. So, um, and also another thing about COVID, remember that the, the exam was written, this exam was written a while ago. In other words, this is this exam was not written because it has to be translated into so many different languages alone. So just know that that translation and back translation and the comparison of the versions takes time. And so that's the reason why you're not going to, that's another reason why you won't see COVID on the exam. And so do be mindful of that um, as you're, as you're preparing. You don't need to know if something came out this year, or frankly, if it came out late last year, you still don't need to know it necessarily, it's helpful to know it, right? But it may not necessarily be tested on the exam. And the reason why is because that study has to actually be disseminated into practice. And so Sakita mentioned the, rep, you know, the replicated studies that are done in order to show whether or not something can be, you know, utilized, but also it has to do with, um, with just the amount of time that it takes to actually get into the textbooks and all these wonderful books that we've got here. So it takes time to get all of that information out, out there. Any other comments? I'm going to look at the chat one more time. Oh, two forms of ID on the day of the exam. Do take a look at the letter that they sent you. If they're asking you for two forms of ID, by all means, take two forms of ID and make sure that they are appropriate forms of identification. Yes, the ABM protocols are internationally applicable. Yes, that is true. Yes. The ABM is an international group of physicians dedicated to this work. So the thing about the ABM, their protocols can change as soon as some updated, they don't wait until December 31st, right? You might look at a, at a protocol and uh, you might look at it again and it's been revised. And so I always say to people, stay updated. That's an excellent way to stay updated. Absolutely, it's a wonderful resource. And then somebody, I think we'll end with this, um, unless you found the answer for WHO and vitamin D, Sakita, did you happen to find oh, that? Can you I Google was, that? Uh, yeah, let me check that out. I, uh, so while you're doing that, so somebody has a question here. 
Is the window for results now that the exam is online still three-ish months? The answer is yes, it is. And there's a reason why it is. So I'm going to talk for a minute so that Sakita has time to research. And so the reason why it takes so long, it has nothing to do with the fact that the exam is online. It has everything to do with the fact that the exam is translated, is disseminated throughout the world. And then they actually take a look at each individual question to find out how it performed to see psychometrically that it, that it performed in the way that was expected. And if it did not, they try to find out why. And so that is the reason why it takes so long for the exam results to get back to you. Because even though you're taking it online, there are some far-flung parts of the world where they don't have access to online testing. And so since this is an international credential as well as exam, they actually have to get all of those results in, bring, put them into the computer, and then run the testing on it, run the psychometric testing on it, and then they actually may take a look at a question, see that it performed poorly in your language, and they may actually discard that question, and then they discard the question, and then they re-score they re, um, everything. And so it's really nice to know that they're actually taking a look at each individual item and know that it's clinicians from around the world who are actually in practice and in research and working in hospitals, working in the community, just like you who created this exam. And so do know that they're not trying to gotcha that these questions, that there should be enough information in each one of the questions, in the stem of the question, and in each response is for you to be able to, to answer it. Don't think of the yeah, but, or I know someone who, stick with what is known and don't read into the question. Just take a look at that piece. And the... Um, so actually the World Health Organization does recommend it. And I was sitting here about to put share it into the, the chat. In the chat. Great, thank you. Uh, and someone else asked the other developmental milestone research. So it's not a develop for pictures, it's not a developmental milestone uh, website, but it is an infant website. So you can see different pictures of infants like rashes and things. And that's Stanford University, Dr. Jane Morton. Uh, in their newborn section on Stanford University's website. That's where you can find that one. And someone asked a question about Brazil. Uh, if you'll have an exam in Brazil due to the pandemic, uh, if, if IBLCE is doing the exam and if it is in Portuguese in Brazil, that of course would be wonderful. Um, because indeed that is something which um, they do try to get the exam translated into different languages all around the world. Someone is asking what the pass rate is. They actually change the cut rate and the pass rate on an annual basis, again, based on the psychometric principles. The pass rate is usually around 78%, I wanna say, Sakita, 74 to 78%. If you really want to know, you can actually go into um, on, on the IBLCE website. Maybe I shouldn't suggest this a few days before the exam, but you can actually go to the IBLCE website and see the exam reports where they actually broke, they break down what the um, standard deviations and who scored what and the raw scores and everything else. So they just do an aggregate as well as the different topics that are covered. And so, again, that's an important thing. If there is an area that you're really feeling weak, if you work in the community and you've never seen a NICU baby, then do brush up on your NICU content. If you work in a NICU and you've never seen a baby older than three months of age breastfeed, then definitely take a look at some of those long-term breastfeeding questions because they will be on the exam. They will be on the exam. Okay, good. Yeah, that's great that you mentioned that, Angela, because as I talked about taking your temperature, your exam temperature, it is exactly that. The areas that you know that you're confident in, you can just be confident in that knowledge, right? But if there are areas that you've identified that you need to brush up on, those are the areas where if you're taking the test in September, where it would be a good idea to go ahead and, and, and do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, good. Good. Well, this has been wonderful. This has been fun. Yes. Thank you so much for bringing all of these questions. They've been phenomenal. Um, do reach out to us if you have any other questions. Uh, also, our LER has a uh, our 
Facebook group where we're asking questions. Um, one thing is some of the questions that we put in this exam review don't necessarily share those. We actually do use these, we recycle these, so please don't share those online. And especially if you're like, well, I don't understand what they were talking about with preglandular and everything else, you know, do reach out to us and we can explain it further if you'd like, or at least point to some of your textbooks that can explain it a little bit more in detail. Uh, so we're happy to do that. This recording will be posted on our website. Um, our, our tech team is hard at work in getting this uploaded. And as soon as it's done, as soon as we close it out, they're going to find a spot and they're going to make it obvious and they're going to upload it onto our website so you can watch it again. Again, thank you all very much, Sakita. Thank you. This was a pleasure. I like this. So I hope that the excitement and the confidence continues. Thank you for joining us and, and best wishes and good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.